On the night of July 15th, factions of the Turkish military, which were linked to the Gulenist terror cult, launched a coup attempt. Confusion and chaos swept across the country. As the future of Turkey hung in the balance, the coup plotters raced to control the flow of information. Media has played a crucial role in terms of quashing the coup. Journalists became prime targets, but they were also front row witnesses to how the night unfolded. Here's their story. Nadim Chenaire is an investigative journalist. He had a simple and normal life with his loving wife and daughter. In 2007, he decided to investigate the murder case of Armenian journalist Horant Dink. He didn't know then that he was about to walk into a nightmare. As Shenner dug deeper, he realized it was no ordinary case. He says that all the arrows pointed towards a secretive group that had infiltrated the police force. He was talking about the followers of Fetula Gulen, the leader of a terror cult called Gulenists. Gulen, a former imam from Turkey who lives in self-imposed exile in the U.S. Turkey's National Security Council now says that the Gulenists have for years been infiltrating state institutions and labels the group a terrorist organization. But nine years ago, Schenner was a lonely voice sounding the alarm. While I was looking into Rant Dink's murder case, I realized that members of the Gulenist terror organizations were behind it. People immediately warned me to stay out of it. They used the Turkish expression, don't stick your staff into the beehive. I said, I'm not just sticking my staff, I'm sticking my whole hand into it. The Gulenists began to threaten Chenaire to drop his investigation. When he refused, he quickly discovered that it wasn't just the police force the group had infiltrated. I was immediately convicted by Gulenist prosecutors. They initially sentenced me to 32 years, while Harant Dink's murderer, Ogun Samast, was only sentenced to 20 years. But even that wasn't enough for the secret organization. Soon, Chenier's phones were tapped, and he said false evidence was planted on him. He had never had a criminal record, but now he was accused of being part of a team that was going to assassinate President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's son. I thought they were going to kill me. I knew they were murderers because of the way they threatened me. But at least I knew that there is the written law, and a trial will show that their accusations are not true. Anyone would see that my actions were in accordance with journalism and not acts of terrorism. For years, Chenier was the face of resistance to what he was convinced was a grave Gulenist threat. Now he only wishes he could have done more before the Gulenist enacted to take over an entire country. Erdogan Aktash, the director of CNN Turk, had just finished another ordinary day at work. But within a few hours, he would have to make some of the most strategic moves of his life. I saw some really strange photos being uploaded on Twitter. Rumors were circulating, and then there was news that one soldier clarified that it was solely for security measures. More photos were getting uploaded, and my phone didn't stop ringing. I wasn't able to come to terms with what was happening. I was talking to CNN Turk headquarters and calling my friends working at the editorial desk. I was saying, just hold on for a moment, stay calm. And then it hit me. I instantly emailed our editorial group, saying, I could be exaggerating a little, but everyone get some spare clothes and quickly come to the newsroom. I think this is a coup attempt. That night, Aktash and his colleagues tried to do their work while simultaneously fearing for their lives. I was so scared. 
To tell you the truth, our Ankara office is located near government buildings. It's very close to the presidential palace. Jets were flying very low over us. Helicopters were opening fire without warning. There were many lives that were lost as they were firing randomly. Because of this, we had to run downstairs four times to take shelter. But most of all, Firat was worried for her child. Throughout the night, I received several calls from my daughter, screaming and crying, asking me if I was alive and asking me to come home. She repeatedly asked who was bombing us and why and if we were all going to die. I struggled when I tried to explain what was happening. The military started seizing airports in other strategic locations. Like past Turkish coups, Turkish public broadcaster TRT was a prime target. About 100 armed soldiers stormed the TRT building at about midnight. As someone who has witnessed a coup before, I knew that there was going to be some sort of statement. But TRT is assumed to have a symbolic meaning because previous coup announcements were made from the TRT studios. So before they arrived, we had an idea that they would try this again. And knowing this, we tried to get in touch with Turksat, direct broadcast satellite, to kill the satellite feed. But we couldn't reach anyone there because an hour before soldiers had raided it. We wanted to get back into TRT and disconnect the master server, but there were only a few of us and six police officers. TRT deputy director in Ankara, Ibrahim Eran, was standing in front of the soldiers urging them to surrender. Even though he was a potential target. We overheard shouting. Before we even knew what was going on, the military came upstairs. I will never be able to forget that moment for the rest of my life. They said they were taking over the station on behalf of the Turkish armed forces. They made us all lie down, then they took us downstairs. I found out later the one giving orders was Lieutenant Colonel Umut Gençaj. When we were downstairs, they told us to lie down again on the floor. They tied our hands behind our back. At first they said they were doing this because of a threat they had received from Daesh and they were here to protect us. Then someone above these soldiers started to give commands to the soldiers. He said if anyone tries to speak again or asks a question, First, hit them with your weapon, and then if you need to shoot them, do it. This is not a joke. It was then that I figured out that it wasn't a terrorist threat, but a coup attempt. The lieutenant colonel called out that he will be reading the military statement, and so he put an official uniform over his camouflage uniform. They told me I had to read the military statement, that those were the orders from the commander-in-chief. I said, how can I? I can't do this. They told me I had no choice. My knees and hands were shaking. I actually had to clamp my hands like this. When the soldiers raided the gallery, I couldn't talk to my daughter. I couldn't inform her or talk to anyone in my family. It was terrible.
Derhal açık herhangi bir televizyon var. We couldn't prevent the military statement. We looked for other private channels that were still broadcasting. We got in touch with Channel 24, where Ardan Zenturk's program was on. Vatandaşlarımız TRT'den yapılan bu yayına hiçbir şekilde itibar etmesin. Evet. Çünkü bu yayın tamamen korsan yayındır. I was in the middle of a special broadcast about the Nice attacks. Soldiers also raided TRT's English language network, TRT World in Istanbul. Well, actually, just before we got outside, I heard one of our colleagues say, come on, please, the soldiers are outside. We need to go now. We have to evacuate the building as soon as possible. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Everyone, as soon as possible. But it was just, he did raise his voice at one point, the only time, and it turned out to be a command to turn in our mobile phones. Of course, when we heard it was a coup underway, we realized they probably wanted our mobile phones because they didn't want us communicating anything, especially via social media. They didn't want us taking pictures. In attempt to limit other forms of communication, soldiers stormed cell phone and internet service providers like Turkcell and Turkish Telecom, but they were unable to cut service. The coup plotters' failure to prevent the flow of information on new media would prove to be their downfall. Journalists use online avenues to notify the public. As soon as I found out about the coup attempt, I decided to head directly to the office, TRT World. But it was taken over by the soldiers. So I decided to film everything um, that was taking place on the streets through social media. I was using my motorcycle, which helped me bypass the traffic that was stuck because of the barricades the soldiers set up. But another motorcycle wasn't as lucky as I was. Um, I thought it would be a quick and easy way to communicate with my social media followers what was happening. So it was a handy tool to have um, to be able to explain to people quickly what was happening and to be able to show them uh, with their own eyes what I was seeing. Right, I think a jet just flew really, really close to us and there was a loud explosion. I'm not sure it's... There is definitely gunfire now. They are firing into... I'm not sure where. When I came in front of TRT, I started to broadcast everything that was going on live from my Facebook. We were trying to get the soldiers to surrender. Every time we tried, they shot at us. The number of followers on my Facebook page were increasing so fast, I was shocked. That's when I understood how powerful of a media source the social media had become. Thanks to these videos, people were able to see that the Gulenist faction of the military were opening fire on civilians. Ferrat was watching the videos of the soldiers shooting civilians on social media, and she was desperately trying to find out if President Recep Tayyip Erdogan was still alive. He had been scheduled to deliver a speech an hour before, yet there was only silence. So I called the president's team asking what was going on. They said that they wanted to connect through the live video streaming app Periscope, but because of technical problems, they couldn't. So I asked them to make a statement live through us. He checked with the president. One very long minute passed before he came back and said, OK, we will go live through you. I said, let's do FaceTime. And then everything happened so quickly. The future of Turkey hung in the balance as one of the most famous FaceTime connections of all time was established. Hello. 
Sayın Cumhurbaşkanım dinliyoruz biz sizi. Ha, i̇yi akşamlar. İyi akşamlar efendim buyurun. İyi akşamlar. Alo. Tabii bugünkü bu gelişme gerçekten e, silahlı kuvvetlerimizin içerisindeki bir azınlığın ne yazık ki kalkınma e, hareketidir. Ve bu malum yapıya ait paralel yapılanmanın teşvik ettiği üst akıl olarak onların kullandığı bir harekettir. Ülkemizin birliği, beraberliği, bütünlüğüne yönelik bu harekete karşı inanıyorum ki milletçe vereceğimiz e, güzel bir cevapla e, bunlar gerekli olan cezayı alacaklardır. Bu tip konularda Cumhurbaşkanı'nın görüntüsü de önemli. During a coup it's so important for people to know that the president is still alive. I could hear my heart beating fast, my hand was shaking, and I was trying to force my arm to stand still so I could hold the phone. This was the first public statement from the head of the state revealing a Gulenist minority in the armed forces of carrying out the attempted coup. Milletimizi illerimizin meydanlarına davet ediyorum, havalimanlarına davet ediyorum ve milletçe meydanlarda, havalimanında toplanalım ve bunların o azınlık grubu tanklarıyla, toplarıyla gelsinler. Ne yapacaklarsa halka orada yapsınlar. Halkın gücünün üstünde bir güç ben tanımadım bugüne kadar. The president may have appeared small on the phone screen, but the impact was huge. Millions of people poured onto the streets. President Erdogan flew to Istanbul after his rallying cry to the nation. Sources later said he left his Marmaris Hotel only 15 minutes before it was raided by the soldiers. It was really motivating when we found out that the president was alive and heard him telling people to take to the streets. I think that was when the nation had a clearer understanding of what was required from them. When I saw Erdogan on screen, I was relieved because the president was alive and was now in control. He urged people to take to the streets, even though it was very alarming. Seeing people risking their lives, standing in front of tanks was just an amazing moment. Many people can criticize Erdogan. Some people may not vote for him. Regardless of those criticisms, he has a major effect on the Turkish people. This is not the first time. In all moments of crisis, he has managed to turn the tide in his favor. Why? Because the people believe in him. I'm not exaggerating. About 10,000 people waving Turkish flags suddenly streamed into Istanbul's most famous street, Istiklal Avenue. They pushed their way towards Taksim Square and the soldiers who were waiting there. The soldiers were stuck and soon they started to fire and yet more people started heading onto the streets. <laughs> Bullets were flying past us. What sounded like gunshots were overheard near Taksim Square and on Istiklal Street. It was so chaotic because we didn't know who was firing at who. But we still managed to do our job and explain what was happening. Turkey has experienced four coups and military interventions since the founding of the Republic in 1923. But this was the first time that soldiers raided a private television channel.
After CNN Turk broadcast President Erdogan's call to resist, the soldiers wanted revenge. But journalists at CNN Turk didn't back down. They reached our floor. I stood in front of them. I said, stop and stay calm. When they claimed they were only following orders, I interrupted and said that these were unlawful orders and that they have a right to disobey. I told them to have some water and calm down, but another lieutenant came. This time they were more harsh and said that the place needed to be emptied. They also said that we needed to stop broadcasting. Erdogan Aktash and his team predicted that the military would raid the channel, so they planned ahead. I got a wireless microphone and put it into my pocket. I tried to communicate with our viewers by using a wireless microphone. I wanted to inform people that we were trying to keep broadcasting, using at least our phones to stream a live program on Facebook or social media. At the same time, there was turmoil in the building. Police Special Operation Forces were at the entrance to the building. I got a call saying that the Special Forces were asking to cut off the power in order to attack the coup soldiers. But I said, don't even think about it, because I didn't want to lose the broadcast. At that moment, I could hear shots being fired. Amid all the chaos, there was one thing that Erdogan Aktash was sure of. That channel is going to continue broadcasting no matter what. The world can end or an earthquake can happen. We will not stop broadcasting. That's it. Meanwhile, people in the streets were trying to save those who were captured inside CNN Turk. Among them were fellow journalists. During the coup attempt, I saw how they sent soldiers to CNN Turk and NTV, and I witnessed how they detained journalists. I went to CNN Turk and came face to face with the coup plotters. I screamed, get out of here, you have raided my home. We were in a physical altercation with them. Maybe one or two hours passed. One of my colleagues asked me if I had seen if the soldiers were still upstairs. I looked and they were not there. The workers in the gallery room said they were gone. My friends who were locked in the room also came out. We hugged each other. Unaware of what was happening, maybe two minutes later, I heard the voices of people in the studio. So many people flooded into this studio. I saw our director and he held me and said, Miss Tijan, calm down, don't get scared. Many journalists noted the young age and confusion on the faces of the coup soldiers. It later became clear that many had no idea they were participating in a coup attempt. They had been provided with false information about anti-terrorism operations from superior officers and were only following orders. The young soldiers were overwhelmed when millions of people poured into the streets, and the coup attempt stood no chance. Turkey's reaction against the coup showed the world that there is still a unified nation, that we are still family, and that when we are motivated, there's nothing we can't do. Turkey had experienced four previous coups and military interventions. But this time, the people stood up and said, if you want power, you need to get it at the ballot box. Music